I don't always like to talk about things that we know before we've earned them in talking about historical figures. But in this case, I think that that's going to be helpful. Uh, Galileo Galilei was one of the most influential figures in all of modern science to the point where he has been almost mythologized and there are apocryphal stories surrounding him that are either loosely attributed to him or they're something that is consistent with his pattern of thought, but we don't always necessarily know exactly what happened and how much of it has just been embellished in remembrance or honor of him because he was such a, a, a wonderful figure in modern science. He in a large part paved the way to the scientific revolution from which we've all benefited today. Um, I'm showing you on the screen right now, uh, the cosmic calendar. And this is an idea proposed by Carl Sagan in the 70s and then recently popularized by Neil deGrasse Tyson in the series Cosmos. And I think it's a wonderful uh, perspective aid because we can know things now about the early universe that we just simply couldn't have known at the time of Galileo, that, which we'll be talking about today. Um, so just to put in perspective uh, the timeline of discoveries, let's go back and visualize uh, the entire known history of the earth, 13.8 billion years of the universe, sorry. Um, and now compress that into just one uh, metaphorical year. Now, January to February, as you can see on the top left, that's right after the Big Bang, there's the cosmic microwave background. We move all the way towards the con condense condensation of the hot plasmas and matter into uh, actual material that forms galaxies. And then the, the disk of the Milky Way appears in May. Halfway through this year of all of known history, we start to have things like uh, the solar system uh, begins to form and we and things that we're skipping over include all the, the stars being birthed and reborn and spewing out heavier elements that are used to form organic life later on. But um, we don't start to see the earliest formation of our solar system really until September of this year. That's nine twelfths of the way through. Then we start to see primitive life forms evolve. Then we have uh, the earth, dinosaurs, uh, mammals, birds, the evolution as we know it continues. Now look at the calendar. This all happens in December and not even the really the entire month. It's mostly the second half. The last two weeks of this year are when things start to really get interesting for us. Now the final minute, this is the last 60 seconds before midnight of this year, which leads up to the very present moment. Um, that's where we basically have homo sapiens as we know it today. And the last 10 seconds or so between 10 and five is where we start getting written records. And what we're gonna be talking about today happens in the last three-ish seconds of this cosmic calendar. So just to put in perspective, we are at the very beginning of some really interesting things. Um, the questions that we're wrestling with are still relatively new to us. We haven't even begun to evolve the intuition and wisdom to handle these big ideas. They just simply weren't known. We're just very fresh to them even though 300, 400 years feels like a long time, in terms of uh, the cosmic scale, it's really just a flash of an instant. And that brings us to the moment of Galileo. So what we're gonna talk about first is what was known up to that point. Now we have such a, a society and culture of flourishing technology in almost every aspect. Everything you do is literally just dripping with technology and not primitive technology either. Uh, technology that requires huge amounts of expertise, teams and hordes of, of engineering and, and computer experts that have uh, dedicated their entire lives to the study of very specific things. Um, not even a hundred years ago, you could use your intuition to uh, work on maybe a primitive engine or understand the basics of how an electric switch would work. But today, your phone has uh, countless Nobel Prize winning discoveries embedded in it and that are necessary for it to function. Um, so we need to actually consciously transpose our mindset back uh, to the point where we knew essentially nothing. Now on this timeline of major discoveries here, um, antiquity is on the far left. Now antiquity is what the uh, probably best understood by the ancient Greeks and Romans, Greco-Roman history, where they really didn't know much about the world, but they were very good at describing the little bit that they did follow. And by that, I mean the stars and the motions, those were the really big points. Um, and the only differentiation they could make in the sky was uh, stars seemed to always be fixed from night to night. 
And over the course of a year, they would eventually move around and rotate. So they would change their rise time. And it, it turns out for reasons we'll, we'll go into more in just a minute, it comes out about a minute earlier every night. So a star in one position, while it won't move relative to any of the stars nearby, it will be moving as a whole. And over the course of a year, it resets. So this was a mysterious motion, but they, they spent um, a lot of time thinking about very creative ways why that might happen. Not very many were close to the truth. Um, it did seem to the casual observer that the universe moved around the Earth. And this geocentric model was the norm for a very long time. And it was not really challenged because it was passed on uh, by oral and some very primitive written records uh, for uh, essentially since the, the beginning of human recorded history. Now, there was one distinction to that, and that was the planets. And the, the word planeta is uh, Latin for wanderer or the wanderer. Um, all that meant is that they noticed that the planets would move relative to the background stars so that everything was fixed in the sky with these five or so exceptions. They noticed that what we now know as Mercury, Venus, uh, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, the, the five naked eye planets, uh, they were uh, bright enough that they seemed like stars. They didn't really have any different appearance. They have very distinctive colors, but they also seem to move relative to the sky unlike all the other background stars. So to differentiate that from stars, they, they call them planets. So essentially only two things about the sky were known, stars and then planets, the few five exceptions to the rule. And of course, uh, it wasn't that long ago that we felt that the earth was flat. And this is again, based on our day-to-day uh, -day intuition, there were actually not a lot of compelling reasons to challenge the notion that the earth was flat. So. Fast forward to 380 BC or so, we have Aristotle, um, who was a very strong proponent of the geocentric model. Now, while we know today that he was not uh, correct in that, um, his thought process was not necessarily wrong. He was making a, an informed uh, hypothesis about a set of observations, and the method that he used and that he passed on uh, is still used today in, in a lot of ways. And so he wasn't wrong. He was very skeptical of his observations and challenged them. But the ultimate conclusion was uh, a limitation of the technology. They didn't have the ability to test further than what they knew. So a geocentric model was not insane 2000 years ago. Now, um, 276 BC, we have Eratosthenes who uh, proposed an experiment to test the shape of the earth. Now I'm gonna show you what that looked like real quick. Um, Eric, I bring this up because- Yes, please. Um, Mike has his hand raised. Mike, would you like to ask a question? Go for it. You need to unmute. There we go. I had the mute on. Um, you mentioned a little bit ago the idea that the earth was flat. And I'm curious, who actually believed that? Um, at the time, everyone. Um, no. There were really. Go ahead. No, I'm sorry. We no. had sailors going over the curves of the earth. They knew it wasn't flat. We had people right. going to different continents. They knew it wasn't flat. Right. As technology improved, that's where we started to get uh, these questions that challenged it. So the prevailing wisdom was that the earth had no shape. It was just an infinite plane in all directions. But then as we started developing, like you said, the ships and the mass over the horizon was one of those things that couldn't be explained by uh, the model at the time. And so that's where we get to Eratosthenes um, and others who were, were curious about why these things didn't always make sense. Um, and uh, in, in certain flat plains, it was also observed that um, a caravan traveling over land would appear like the tops of the, the riders would appear before uh, the livestock and things like that. So they weren't sure exactly what was going on. Um, so Eratosthenes proposed an experiment to basically test the angle of the shadows on the highest, on the, the uh, solstice, the day the sun is the highest on uh, usually around June 21st in the summer. And so what he noticed is that at Syene, um, and I'm, I'm distilling a lot here, but just yeah. for the sake of time, but in uh, Syene, it turned out that they were able to see all the way to the bottom of the wells and the shadows came in uh, from the parallel rays of the sun and reached the very bottom, but they didn't on the rest of the days of the year. So on that same day in Alexandria, uh, several hundred miles north, um, they were not able to see all the way to the bottom. And what they realized is that the only way they could explain this is by uh, the assumption that the parallel rays of the sun were encountering the curved surface of the earth, 
So even though the, uh, the shadow, the well was perpendicular to the ground, um, it wasn't straight up and they were oriented differently, implying a curved surface and then using some basic uh, trig, they were able to calculate the circumference of the earth to within a few percent of the modern value. Um, so this casts a whole new light on the, the recent flat earth movement, which is quite objectively 2000 years late to the game and completely wrong. But these uh, methods of, of inquiry were what was really important at the time. And nowadays we could repeat this experiment with uh, two cell phones in about five minutes. Um, back then this required a lot more large scale coordination and planning. Um, and uh, it, it was testing an idea that was not known or popular at the time. So um, evidence was, was harder to record objectively and quantifiably, but uh, this was a, a, a testament to that kind of work. Um, and we'll go back real quick. So um, Ptolemy in AD uh, 150, he basically formalized a lot of ideas about uh, celestial motions that had been circulating in kind of tribal wisdom that had been passed down. He codified a lot of that and got very accurate measurements and, and added a lot of precision to the general consensus of how the heavens worked. Um, his, his work was used by a lot of different cultures and, and formed the basis of modern astronomy in a lot of different areas, even though it wasn't completely accurate. And he still did not reject the notion of a heliocentric, uh, sorry, of a geocentric universe. Now, the first person to do that was Copernicus in uh, 1543. He proposed uh, a set of ideas and observations that supported his belief that the uh, world might not be the center of the universe, but instead revolving around the sun. Um, it wasn't long after that that Galileo lived, and that's why I bring this up, because the idea was very fresh in the minds of people at the time, uh, relatively speaking, and, and factor in that in the 1500s, information did not propagate quickly. It took a long time for news to reach different people and then for the, the cultural uh, reception to warm up to new ideas. And uh, as people are so good at, they were met with heavy skepticism at first. And well, there was a major religious component to that as well, which we'll see later. Um, Kepler in 1609 formalized a lot of ideas that were formed earlier by Copernicus and Galileo. And he, he really uh, put some, some uh, strict formal mathematical descriptions on the motions of the planets. And then we get to uh, Newton and Leibniz and then all the way uh, the last 100 years to the 20th century where we have Einstein and the modern era of physics where we can see, I mean, we're within a lifetime of some of the most astounding discoveries of physics. But uh, the scientific revolution had not taken place. And so Galileo is paving the way. He is in an era where your intuition about the daily world still had a lot of value and there were a lot of very fundamental ideas that had still not been understood uh, very well. So Galileo, um, at, we can see in the timeline, he preceded these, these uh, great scientists before him. Um, Galileo's father was a musician, but he was a very successful one and very well respected in the community. And he had six children and he encouraged those children to pursue something that he would consider more uh, practical. So Galileo was specifically pushed into uh, medicine from an early age. But his dad was very intentional about fostering a spirit of curiosity in the young Galileo. And uh, one of the, the first instances of Galileo's scientific intuition coming to light was in his exposure to the harmonic series, which I'm going to take one second and explain. Um, for those of you who don't read music, this might not make a whole lot of sense. So I'll try to keep that in mind. But what you're looking at here is just two stabs. So this is a very the low C on the piano. And then each of these notes represents a natural uh, series that occurs. It's a uh, preordained series of uh, resonance that happen when you strike a note that is, or a string that is able to freely vibrate that's pinned on both ends. Now, uh, on the bottom left here, you can see the standing wave diagram. These are just the way the natural standing waves will form. And so they, they have uh, this pattern that you can see follows this interesting little curve. Um, I'm going to play what that sounds like. If you've never heard this, this is a really interesting exercise. And make sure your speakers are all the way up. I'm going to turn this up. Hopefully that will come through for you as well. Mm -hmm. 
So you can see it sounds kind of like what our modern ears, Western ears would recognize as a scale, but not quite. It's, it's not uh, been tempered at all. But what Galileo noticed is that when his dad would play the lute, he noticed that the pitch and the, yes, I heard someone. Oh, um, I don't, I, I didn't hear anything. Did anybody else hear that? I heard it just fine. I got my speaker turned up. I don't know. Oh, well. Here, Go it's, ahead. Uh, okay. Um, I can share the link after if you want to remind me. Um, not a problem. Um, so what Galileo noticed was that uh, this fascinating phenomenon was that um, the length of the string that was allowed to vibrate was directly related to the frequency of that pitch. So the, the notes would change depending on the length. So he realized that as magical as it first seemed to him, there was a method to it and something would happen. So as the length would change on the strings, the pitch would change, and he was associating these two events. Um, there's something about length, something about the way we perceive that change to our ears. Uh, he didn't really quantify anything here, but it, the experience of noticing this natural phenomenon stuck with him uh, from an early age. Now, a lot of the things that Galileo did, um, he was one of the first to formally study a lot of phenomenon that he didn't necessarily advance to their final or ultimate um, conclusion, but he paved the way for people to get started. And his curiosity was so widespread that he, he made headway in a lot of areas that we, we won't be able to cover all of them today, but I want to talk about a few key points that he uh, got, he kind of jump started for people to piggyback on down the road. One area that he uh, noticed in, later in life, this was in his university days, um, I should mention that he did switch from medicine into mathematics at a certain point. His dad allowed him to take a geometry course, um, not wanting to uh, uh, dissuade him from a lucrative, stable career, but he also knew that he was kind of interested in the world, so he didn't want to stifle that. And so one of the things that Galileo noticed, and this is one of those sort of apocryphal stories, we're not exactly sure where he first encountered this thought, um, but at some point he noticed a pendulum, uh, it's often described as a chandelier swinging in a lab, and he noticed that by using his pulse, um, the frequency with which it would swing, the motion didn't seem to change by how far away it was. And so what he didn't uh, fully appreciate, but he had a hunch for, was what we call harmonic motion today. So on the top left, we have just a simple mass system. This is a classic physics example where we have a perfectly frictionless uh, attachment point here. We have a mass freely swinging at the bottom and then a massless rod connecting the two. So a mass spring system has a period uh, that's determined by one uh, complete path uh, repetition there. So from the left all the way back to the left, that's one complete period. Um, what you're seeing on the edge here, if I hope that's coming through smoothly, the blue one is the idealized frictionless mass. The gray one has a little bit of air friction put into it. But what he noticed is that it didn't really matter how far away you dropped it. So uh, up here on the right, you can see that this amplitude, even though that goes all the way uh, significantly further than the black mass, the blue mass and the black one and the mid-height brown mass all cross the bottom at the same point. So their period is unaffected by the mass, which seemed a little weird to him. Um, and the example on the bottom left shows that the only thing that changes the period is the length. And this fundamental discovery, or at least um, awareness that the period of an oscillator is tied to its uh, length as opposed to the mass, paved the way for a lot of modern timekeeping devices, modern in the 1600s. Um, now, let's do one quick sidebar. I just want to point out why this is relevant at the time. Um, it does seem kind of like an abstract uh, academic exercise to think about springs and masses and lengths and periods, but there is a very practical reason at the time that we take for granted today. So um, bear with me for about one minute here. Um, there are two ways to define a day. A, there's a sidereal day and a solar day. Now, a sidereal day is one complete rotation uh, relative to the same point in space. And you'll notice that's actually, um, sorry, that should be 23 hours and 56 minutes, not 26, my bad. Um, that's the time it takes the Earth to spin around from one point to the same fixed point in space. 
Now, a solar day is exactly 24 hours by definition, uh, with a few exceptions, but for now, we'll just say that. Uh, and you can see on the diagram here in position three, the Earth has moved a little bit in its orbit. So the amount of extra time it takes to point back to the sun from that uh, increment of its orbit that it advanced from the first day, that's where that extra four minutes comes from. Now, um, the uh, another natural consequence of this observation when you're not looking at the sun but the stars is that the stars rise about uh, four minutes earlier from one day to the next. And the entire sky, you can think about it as uh, 360 degrees of sky. There's about 365 days in a year because the Earth's orbit is not perfectly circular. And that gets really messy really quick. So I'm just going to keep it there. Um, it basically divides down to uh, one degree of motion per day. Now, knowing the fact that stars rise about four minutes earlier and the, the stars are one degree uh, further west every day in their position from night to night, um, that allows longitude to be calculated. Latitude is almost trivial to calculate because it's just measured by your, uh, the, the angle that the uh, North Star Polaris forms from your position on Earth. So that can be determined very easily. Um, the harder part is determining longitude. Um, so uh, for maritime navigation, when you have no longer any fixed landmarks to use to track your position, what you can do if you had accurate timekeeping abilities was to measure where you uh, saw a star rise and its position and time, and then compare the difference in rise time from a table of where you would expect based on your latitude and longitude. And then you could use that difference to calculate how much further. So if it rises a little bit earlier or a little bit later, you can use that difference and translate it into a number of miles uh, east or west of your previous known position. And then you can use that in conjunction with your latitude and you can get a very accurate position, at least good enough for navigating across the open ocean back then. Um, Galileo did not find a great way to make that work um, that wasn't affected by the, the waves on the ocean. And so that was still a problem to be solved, but he did pave the way for this, this invention to uh, reach the levels of precision necessary to be useful for commercial maritime navigation. Another interesting um, tie-in that Galileo is not directly uh, attributed with, but he again started the idea, is the Foucault pendulum about 200 years later. Now, Galileo noticed one thing about mass that we haven't talked about yet, and that's that mass has what we call inertia which or, or momentum, um, the ability of an object in motion to remain in motion unless it's acted upon by another force. Now, Newton picked up a lot of these ideas and he codified them extremely well. And we still give him uh, the credit for describing things like projectile motion and Newton's three laws. Um, basically that describe the macro scale behavior of bulk matter. Now, Galileo had uh, suspected this and he talks about it in his writings, but he never got as far as putting equations down or doing um, any substantial experimentation with it. But one, um, consequence of mass wanting to remain in motion when it, it's tended in one direction, it has no ability to change its own course unless an external force acts upon it. So Foucault took this idea of a, a pendulum that's uh, free swinging, but he put it on a special kind of hinge that's able to rotate freely in 360 degrees. What happens then is that as the earth spins beneath the pendulum, the pendulum, while it, the mass at the end of it is still continuously tra tracing out a perfectly straight line while the earth spins beneath it. But us as static observers on the earth, we perceive the mass to be changing directions on its own, which is a kind of almost spooky effect. Um, there is a, a Foucault pendulum up on the campus of CU Boulder. So if you're ever able to check that out when it's safe and practical, I'd highly recommend it. There's, it's a really cool thing to see in person and if you're patient enough, you can actually see changes every couple minutes. And it is just a little more interesting than watching paint dry, but I'd still recommend checking it out. Um, I'm gonna show a quick video, if you wanna turn up your audio for one second, that explains the concept using a merry-go-round and a very primitive 90s animation, but you'll get the idea. Oh, sorry, there is no sound. Um, you can see that the mass as it oscillates back and forth, it's going in a straight line, but as the earth or the platform upon which it's fixed rotates beneath it, it creates the illusion of tracing out an arc. <laughs> 
but it's us that moving that are moving, not it. Okay, so speaking of masses, this is another really critical point that Galileo is, is most famously attributed with that is also fraught with um, some, some embellishment, we'll say. So the famous Pisa experiment where he took two objects of different masses, drastically different masses, and then dropped them off to make a point. There are some things that are very clearly in keeping with Galileo's personality. He was kind of a showman and a little bit of a polemic he had a very strong distaste for authority when it was out of, uh, over the line, I guess. And he made a point of somewhat ridiculing his uh, fellow colleagues because he, he was a very open-minded and curious individual. And a lot of the prevailing wisdom in, in academia at the time was that we take ideas that are given to us and then we guard them because they're presumed to be accurate upon receipt. And Galileo was not that minded at all. He was very, very open to challenging accepted norms and good for him because this idea of masses falling, it's in some senses kind of surprising that it hadn't been discovered before. Um, I, I read some accounts from historians that suspected that this was one of the things that if we had discovered it earlier, it would have set uh, a lot of other things in motion earlier. But it is a little bit curious that this particular behavior hadn't been noticed. Now we know today that objects fall at the same rate. And that's because gravity applies a uniform acceleration with its force as opposed to uh, a force that is proportional to the mass. Now, the experiment itself did not take place in Pisa. That, that is almost certainly not true. Um, if the experiment was performed, which a lot of people think it could have been, it would have been at one of the local universities or someplace where he could have drawn a crowd and made a point of sticking it to the philosophers and scientists because that was his style. Now, uh, I mentioned gravity as an acceleration. One, one way to visualize this is imagine dropping just a single brick and watching it hit the ground. Now, if you had a, an entire pallet of bricks, say 10 by 10 by 10, um, and you dropped all of these bricks at the same time, it doesn't seem surprising to our intuition now that they would all drop at the same rate. But then the next question you could ask yourself is what if they were somehow fused together so as to essentially behave as a single large body of bricks or a single unit? And you can see pretty quickly that even in this thought experiment, um, nothing changes of substance. And so it's not counterintuitive to believe that now that we're thinking about it this way, that the, all the bricks would move at the same rate and there would be no difference between all the br bricks being dropped at the, at the same moment versus one large mass of bricks being dropped by itself at the same point. So this experiment was repeated on the surface of the moon. I'm well, show in my you left right hand, now. I have a, a feather. In my right hand, a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his uh, findings than on the moon. And uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. Uh, the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather for our falcon. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? Which proves that Mr. Galileo was correct in his findings. So whether or not the PISA experiment happened, I think we can all agree that it's way cooler that it did happen with video evidence on the surface of the moon, setting to rest the story once and for all. Now, what did he learn by doing this? Well, Galileo was the first person to really put some heft behind the idea of mass uh, behavior with projectile motion. Um, he, he suspected that the mass was an independent and irrelevant property of the motion. And he was right in ways that are clear now, but I'm gonna show you just the basics of how an object falls and how the behavior changes without regard for the mass. Um, on the left-hand side, we're just looking at an object dropped straight down. Now, what happens here is that the amount 
um, the uh, interval of time is what's evenly spaced. So each point represents the same interval of time, but you can see that the difference between, or distance be, rather, between these two points is gradually increasing. And that is proportional to the square of the time. So if we just pick a unit time, and that's on the far right side, you can see that the distance that it travels in arbitrary units is the square of that time. So that helps explain why you can see uh, larger steps as an object moves faster. And this tracks with what we already know about objects. Now, Galileo also noticed that we can describe projectile motion in two separate components. And this is what physicists call resolving into components of vectors. And basically the terminology doesn't matter. It gets confusing if we don't uh, spend more time on it. So I'll just simplify down here. Basically, you can describe the behavior of an object uh, with regard to its vertical motion. So that's how it's dropping on the left with the red circle, for example. And then you'll notice that the object on the right, it's like a ball rolling off a table. The path or the, the speed that it starts with moving left from right does not change as it moves across. It's that same constant speed. Now, it seems like because it's dropping so quickly, maybe that would change. And this is something that was not, it was puzzled over for thousands of years, but it wasn't really until Galileo that he said, I don't think there's actually a change there. I think that if we were able to just look at the shadow it casts on the ground, as it drops from the table, it wouldn't really change its speed at all. And now we can describe this in terms of Newton's third law. There is no other force or external force acting on it. Once it's imparted an initial velocity, it keeps moving with that until it's met with another object. Now, of course, we're discounting air resistance, which would impose a little bit of drag and slow it down a little. But in a vacuum, this is an accurate description of the behavior. Now, um, you'll see that they also fall at the same speed. So regardless of whether it's moving left or right or has any sort of horizontal com component of motion, the vertical speed is unaffected. So the blue and the red are exactly together at the same height given time, assuming they drop at the same moment. Now, if you if you were to add up the total energy upon impact, the blue one would have slightly more because it has a slightly higher total energy in the addition of the horizontal component. So that speed left to right uh, does add a little bit of energy, but that does not affect the speed at which it drops. So the time squared relationship is what it's called. That is something that Galileo was the first to really describe in, in a descriptive sense, but he never actually came up with the equation. So he, he suspected the proportionality of it. Uh, he did a lot of experimentation to kind of point or prove his point to his colleagues and peers and the general public, but he never actually got the formal equation. And that's Newton uh, down the road where he picked that up and described it in very great detail to the point where we still use that today to describe uh, small distances and small motions very accurately. Um, let me just check. We have a question in the chat. Oh, okay. Um, let's see. So um, some interesting things about gravity that Newton would have loved to have known, but this was just centuries ahead of his time, is that uh, gravity actually travels at the speed of light. Now the acceleration imparted by gravity is able to act at a distance in ways that we're still not fully uh, aware of now. We are still looking into that, but it's suspected that there's a particle involved, but we don't yet know exactly how gravity works over a distance. But what we do know is that gravity diminishes with distance and it acts at the, its reach moves at the speed of light. So what this means is that it never actually reaches zero. So the faintest star that we can see with the most powerful telescopes we have, if their light has reached earth, so too has its minuscule contribution of gravity. So you're never actually able to get away from it completely. It just goes asymptotically to zero as you approach infinity, but it's always there. So the tug of every star in the universe that we're able to see at least is technically acting on you, but the proportional effect where distance comes in is that the, the closer we are to a large mass, which has gravity, that's the, the uh, governing influence on us. So. The, the further they, they are, the less effect it has, but it never fully diminishes to nothing. All right, now Galileo is most famously known for his discoveries in astronomy. And we're gonna spend just a few minutes talking about those. 
and we'll see what kind of trouble those got him into more than just about anything else. Now, he was a controversial figure before his discoveries about astronomy. Um, he just was in an area that wasn't really directly contradicting the notions of the church and, and the ideas that were held sacred by the Roman Catholic Church at the time. So he was kind of a nuisance, but he was not really considered a threat to anything up until he got his hands on a telescope. So that's where things get interesting. Now, to understand what Galileo discovered and why it's, it's relevant and significant, uh, let's just talk real quickly about what a telescope actually is, because there's some misconceptions about that that are really easy to clear up. Um, a telescope has two chief functions that are very different. Uh, the first is to collect light, and the second is to magnify. The main thing that matters with a telescope is its ability to collect light for most purposes. Now, there's all sorts of discussions about detail and resolution, and that does change things. But when it comes to amateur equipment, at least, um, and especially primitive telescopes several hundred years ago, uh, the aperture was the hard part to get. That's the light gathering ability. So the more aperture, the more light gathering, then the longer the length, that's where the magnification comes from. Now, um, what's important to know is that magnification is not hard to achieve on a telescope. You can take any telescope, no matter how cheaply made, put on an eyepiece, which is where the, uh, the magnification happens, and you can get an absurd level of magnification that is well beyond its ability to resolve detail. Um, there's an upper limit known as Dawes limit, which is basically the amount of detail that you can get for a given aperture. So a given like say four inches of aperture on the front side of the telescope, there is a, a physical limit, a physics limit to how much detail you can resolve using visible, visible light. Um, anything above that, you can still keep magnifying, but you will not get any more detail out of it. And in practice, what happens is the object will just appear to get fuzzier and spread out and more diffuse and more out of focus and uh, more opaque. So it's not practical to magnify things, but it can be done. Magnification is the easy thing. Aperture is hard, and that's why it's costly. Now, um, what happens, uh, the, the basic operation of a, a refracting telescope like Galileo had is that light comes in through the front objective. This is the expensive part. Uh, it forms a virtual image just behind the eyepiece. Now, you've, you've probably held uh, a piece of of glass or maybe a magnifying lens at some point, you know what a virtual image is. It's just where the light converges. It'll be flipped upside down. Um, and right behind the eyepiece, this is where the light is now uh, magnified. So the small image where all the light rays are converging, it's taking the surface area of the large opening at the beginning and then concentrating it down to an area that is roughly the diameter of your pupil. And I'm breezing over a lot of details here, but the gist is, is the part that matters, and that's true. Um, the, the light is then magnified through the eyepiece and sent to your pupil. So you're concentrating this huge stream of photons into a very small space. And that's why you can see much fainter things than you can with the naked eye. Now, a secondary part of that is how much you multiply these extra photons in terms of magnification. So up to a point, magnification is very helpful because it allows us to resolve things up to the limit of the aperture that you have. So you can see smaller details than your eye can make out with its uh, fully dilated pupil of about eight millimeters. Uh, not very much, but a telescope can uh, drastically increase the amount of detail available to see while making it brighter. Okay, so that's the operation of a telescope. Uh, what did Galileo's telescope look like? Well, by today's standards, it's overwhelmingly unimpressive. Um, one thing that uh, we like to do when there's when it's not COVID times and we're able to meet in person is actually show you a lot of the discoveries he made, and it can be done on a single night if you uh, pick the right time of year. Um, but the equipment that he used to make these really uh, profound discoveries was actually not that uh, sophisticated by today's standards. And to put that in context, let me show you what his um, some of the the dimensions on this were. Um, the aperture here is about 26 millimeters and the magnification was about 14 times. And again, magnification is just a function of the eyepiece, which is not hard to get. Um, and the focal length was about uh, 1300 or so millimeters. Now the aperture on this telescope, this is a modern telescope that we would normally be able to use. Um, this is about 250 millimeters across. And then 
this little thing here, this is just the IP, or sorry, the, the um, viewfinder uh, uh, spotting scope. It's just what lets you find the main object that you're looking for with a wide angle. It's a little tiny telescope. Now this aperture is 50 millimeters, so twice the uh, diameter of the uh, telescope that Galileo used. And this is just to get things set up. That's not even used for observing whatsoever. Um, sorry, the finder scope. And uh, sorry, that's mislabeled. That should be 250. The focal length of this is roughly the same. It's 1,024 millimeters. So that would be the length from the opening here to the back mirror uh, and then back to the, the eyepiece. And it's a different kind of telescope, but optically they, they would behave in a very similar way, except his uses only lenses. This has a lens and a mirror, but um, the light path that it takes is, is comparable. Um, but 250 millimeters to Galileo's uh, 24 millimeter telescope. So it gives you an idea of what he was able to achieve. Now, uh, what kinds of things did he see? Well, the phases of Venus was one of the first things that he discovered. Now, um, it might seem counterintuitive even today to think about phases on another planet. The inner planets, the interior planets, Mercury and Venus, who are both on the inside of Earth's orbit relative to the sun, um, in the same way that the moon undergoes phases because uh, the angle of our line of sight relative to it changes, uh, Mercury and Venus both go through phases as well. Venus is, is further out and much easier to observe. The image on the right kind of shows that. You can see a little bit of the three-dimensional effect. If we're looking at the sun, these are the orbits of Mercury and then Venus in the gray superimposed on that. And you can see that because they're inside of Earth's orbit, um, they are locked into a, a range on either side of the sun, meaning they can never travel further than that outer limit on either side. The, the widest elongation point is what it's called. Um, and that, that changes depending on which side of the sun they're on and which way we're going and all that stuff. But uh, you can see that they never stray too far from the sun. Now, Mercury, uh, is even closer and much harder to observe. And so Mercury is not, he, we don't have any recorded observations that I'm aware of from Galileo, but Venus is able to go just uh, through the twilight. And not only is it further from the sun and thus easier to view slightly longer after twilight or before dawn, um, it's also closer to us and larger in the sky. And so he was able to, to make out some uh, changes in the phases. And then he also uh, sketched uh, craters on the moon uh, in very great detail. Now, the, the moon observation was one of the first things to get him in some public trouble because the idea that had been established since ancient times and further propagated by Ptolemy and Aristotle was this notion of the immutability of the heavens, meaning they are perfect and they do not change. The idea that planets and uh, moons were all objects of perfect spherical nature, smooth texture. Um, they were blemish free uh, in some way, shape or form. And Galileo looked at the craters on the moon and he clearly saw shadows changing, which implied relief and depth. Uh, and he said, it can't possibly be smooth. That's not just a painted on texture or something happening optically on the surface. This has clearly got depth to it. Um, and that ran him into some trouble with the church. So that was strike one and maybe two of his eventual troubles. Um, sunspots are another thing that he, he looked at. Now, how do you get sunspots through a small telescope? Uh, Galileo and many others actually since him have used what we call the projection method. Um, and this basically involves, and I, I have to say a standard disclaimer, do not try the projection method with anything that you have unless you have special equipment. It will quickly fry uh, possibly your telescope, but most importantly, your eyes. It, it's not a safe method to use anymore. There are specialized telescopes that are fitted for that. Um, I would recommend using a filter or talking to uh, somebody who's got experience with that before attempting on your own. The uh, possibility of error and mistake is so high and the risks are incredibly dangerous. It, it, it can cause permanent blindness and it can cause retinal burning if you even get a glimpse of the sun through this method. Um, so don't try that on your own, but thankfully Galileo did. He did go blind, but for unrelated reasons. Um, what happens here is that you point the telescope at the sun and then pr instead of looking through the eyepiece, which would immediately uh, burn your eyes out, you project the image of the eyepiece and focus it on a screen um, behind it. 
And there are a couple of ways of doing this, but um, what they're doing here is just a straight line of sight path. And what happens is that the sunspots, which are areas of uh, concentrated magnetic activity on the surface of the sun, they block part of the image. And so at first he, he suspected it might be some sort of imperfection in the optics, but he noticed that it moved it across the surface of the sun and it was consistent um, and moved with the image too. So it wasn't just an artifact in the equipment, but rather a uh, feature on the surface of the sun, which again, not only was it considered uh, to be perfect and blemish free, so to speak, um, there, there were details and surface features and uh, this is also at the point when we still didn't really uh, believe that the sun was the center of our solar system. We still thought that the earth was essentially the center of the known visible universe. So one thing that really got Galileo thinking about heliocentrism was uh, his eventual discovery of the moons around Jupiter. And we call them the Galilean moons today uh, in honor of him. This is a proposed model, and I'm, I'm kind of going backwards here. I'm going to show you his conclusion first and then show you how he arrived at it, because I think it's a little easier to see in that order. Um, what he drew here is his guess at how the, um, the sun might be the center of the, un or of the solar system and how the Earth here would have the moon move around it. And you can see he's even indicated uh, the phase changes on the moon. And then uh, he suspected that the four moons of Jupiter were orbiting Jupiter. And again, the, the, uh, the consensus at the time was that in the geocentric model, every single thing in the sky orbited the Earth somehow. Now, uh, there were some uh, exceptions to that. Some people actually had proposed, I think Ptolemy was the first to hint at the idea of a local variation to that where stars might rotate around a specific point. And this was done in response to the inexplicable behavior of the planets um, from millennia before. Even though they didn't understand why they were moving, Ptolemy was very good at predicting where they would be. So eclipses and planet positions were not, um, they, they were very accurate at the time, even though they, they didn't have a very good understanding of why they were accurate. They just knew how to measure the, the predicted motion. But Galileo suspected that instead of these moons moving around Earth and having some sort of weird local fluctuation that caused them to just stay in this little confined region of the sky around Jupiter, he thought, wouldn't it be easier to just explain it by saying that that is a separate body with its own pull on them, and they were uh, tied to Jupiter as opposed to somehow being involved with the Earth and Jupiter and all these weird exceptions. Wouldn't it just be simpler if there was just a single system with those four moons? And we know today he was right, and we call the, the moons, the Galilean moons in his honor. But let's talk about how he got there. This view is roughly what he would have seen when he first turned his telescope at Jupiter. You can see that uh, there is a disk with a measurable size to it, but it's not very big. And this is actually still larger than he would have seen. Um, what, what stands out is the four quote unquote stars around Jupiter. Um, these stars were not visible to the naked eye, and so no one had really uh, developed any sort of mythology or explanation of, of them at the point at that point. Um, so he at first just cataloged them as stars. He just said, oh, I saw Jupiter up close. That was cool. Um, there were four stars by it. But then he noticed that over time, these stars changed position, and that's what started getting him thinking about what might be going on. Um, now, there's a curious phenomenon that happens. Um, most of the solar system, if, if you don't already know, is roughly in the same plane, and we call that plane the ecliptic. Um, and so in that plane, uh, most of the planets move with a few slight eccentricities or inclinations. Um, but what happens in the case of Jupiter and its moons is that they will move um, right behind and in front of the disk of the planet. So they disappear momentarily uh, on either side of that, especially with primitive equipment. It's really hard to track where they go. So he was, Galileo was initially confused because he saw uh, stars appearing, disappearing, and reappearing in uh, no particular order. Now, one of the, the initial challenges in tracking this visually is that the, the uh, moons of Jupiter don't appear visually distinctive from each other. They actually all appear like bright points, as you see on the screen. Um, there's not anything that you can really use to, to know which one you're looking at unless you have a table that shows you now uh, or you start keeping very careful track of the motion uh, more or less uh, over the course of a night 
so that you can see which one is moving at what rate. And then you can start extrapolating uh, patterns and, and models from that. But at first, he didn't really know that that's what was going on. So it took him a while to get to that point. But he did propose the idea that they were bodies that were in a system involved with Jupiter alone. And they might be going in and out uh, behind and in front of the planet, which would explain their, their sudden disappearance and reappearance. Now, in modern terms, um, even with an amateur telescope, you can actually watch the Galilean moon's transit in front of uh, Jupiter. So you can see the disk of the planet and then the moon in front of it. And if it if it lines up just right, you can actually see the shadow cast from these moons onto the surface of Jupiter. Um, and then you can track which ones are going behind. And it's actually really a quick phenomenon. You can see it happen over the period of about an hour um, if, if you're so uh, lucky. Um, it's actually, it, it does happen quite regularly. It's not like a rare occurrence, but it is really impressive to watch and just see how fast a distant body moves relative to a much larger body in the solar system. Um, our own moon takes 29 and a half days to go around. Uh, the moons of Jupiter take uh, sometimes hours uh, on the inner orbit. So it's, it's a really fascinating phenomenon to watch. Um, and there are cases where you'll see a multiple a double transit and in extremely rare cases, we can even see a, a triple transit where three moons are in front of Jupiter at one moment in time, which is really cool to see. Okay, so what, what happened next? This is what Galileo is most famous for. Um, Galileo uh, was basically challenging the Aristotelian and Ptolemaic theories about the Earth's role in the universe to the point where he got himself in trouble with the church. Now, I've mentioned geocentrism was the, uh, the prevailing notion at the time, and that was the theoretical underpinning of the Roman Catholic Church. That was the foundation of a lot of their beliefs. And Galileo's work brought him to the attention of the church by about 1615, when he was called before the Roman Inquisition. And he was accused of heresy in part for his uh, popularizing of beliefs that the earth was not the center of the universe and that the heavens were fallible in some sense. They had their own uh, textures and they were not perfectly smooth, uh, blemish-free spheres and orbs, but rocky planets and, and active bodies, just like everything on the earth that we've observed. And uh, in, in the following year, 16, 15, 1616, the church banned all the works that supported Copernicus's theories uh, about heliocentrism and then they forbade Galileo from discussing his works publicly. So Galileo then decided to keep quiet for 15 years, um, largely because he was ordered to not push that. And he did publish some works uh, somewhat surreptitiously and had them pub manuscripts published outside, but he knew that in his own interest and to preserve his uh, reputation and interest, he decided to not uh, keep talking against the church, but uh, he did continue experimenting. Uh, 1632, after the election of a new pope, uh, who he felt was a little more liberal towards scientific discoveries, uh, he published his second book, Dialogue on the Two Chief World Systems, Ptolemaic and Copernican, uh, in which he actually somewhat cleverly argued both sides of the debate from the science side and the religious side of the de debate, but he did fall on the side of heliocentrism, which was supported by Copernicus. Um, this belief, even though he tried to appeal to the authorities and, and uh, not fall too far astray of their favor, uh, he was still seen as violating a very key tenet of the belief. And so he was summoned to Rome in 1633. This is the famous trial where he was found guilty of suspected heresy. And then he was forced to recant his views publicly and then sentenced to uh, house, house arrest until his death in 1642. Um, while he did publicly recant some of his beliefs, he is also often said to have given the phrase or, or uttered it kind of in protest, and yet it moves or something to that effect, which basically means whether or not uh, this body of authorities agrees with me or has the, the religious doctrine to back up what I'm observing, the behavior is the same regardless. So his, his attitude towards authority was uh, not very favorable when they started contradicting his pretty simple observable um, uh, observations about the world. So his penchant for thoughtful and inventive experimentation, it did push the scientific method towards its modern form. And for that, we're ever grateful. 
but uh, it did come at a very steep personal price. And in some ways, the attention that he gained by pushing against the authority of the church um, paved the way for other scientists to not only hear about Galileo, and they were also exposed to his work, and they picked up the torch. And a lot of the in inventions that came about after uh, were directly because Galileo's uh, runnings with the church just made such waves at the time that they spread a lot further than they might have on their own had the church been comfortable with the progress he was making. Um, one thing to note about the, the trial of the Inquisition is that uh, Voltaire and others often have portrayed him as a martyr for objectivity. There's a lot of historical evidence to support that, um, but modern scholarship tends to show the trial has been a little bit sensationalized, so it tended, in, in reality, it was probably more of a, an academic minutia or just some sort of a council meeting where he was uh, reprimanded and challenged, but it was not the um, Scopes trial of its day as, as it's brought up to be a, a lot of times in, in modern accounts. So fast forward almost 400 years and we have uh, Pope John Paul gives this anemic non-apology and here's what he said. Thanks to his intuition as a brilliant physicist and by relying on different arguments, Galileo who practically invented the experimental method understood why only the sun could function as the center of the world as it was then known, that is to say, as a planetary system. This is my emphasis added here. The error of the theologians of the time when they maintained the centrality of the earth was to think that our understanding of the physical world structure was in some way imposed by the literal sense of sacred scripture. So it wasn't the trial or the imprisonment or anything else that the Catholic church did wrong we just slightly misinterpreted an infallible book. In unrelated news, I'd like to point out the word pontificate, <clears throat> a verb meaning to speak or express opinions in a pompous or dogmatic way. I steer you to example A, uh, Pope John Paul's comments. Unless do you think this counts as moral progress of any sort of substance, uh, I'd like to uh, direct you to the movie Spotlight. I'd highly recommend it. So where does that leave us now in the modern moment? <clears throat> we have uh, such a, a different world. The landscape has completely changed. We have 400 years of rapid, explosive progress in technology, science, engineering. Uh, culture has evolved. Population has exploded. The world is essentially unrecognizable today uh, in a way that couldn't have been envisioned even 100 years ago, much less 400 years ago which is, again, remember only the last couple seconds on the cosmic calendar before the new year begins in the term or in, in large scale time. Um, just to put it all together, a simple example is your typical commute to work. You, you're driving a vehicle that would have been unfathomable to Galileo using all sorts of complex thermodynamics. Uh, you're using a phone, which uses all sorts of crazy cool electromagnetic radiation and propagation. Your phone has a computer and internet connection to it, miniaturized uh, technology that, again, even 30 years ago would have seemed like pure science fiction. Uh, the GPS that your phone or car uses to get you from A to B is reliant on Einstein's special relativity to correct for the relative motion between the GPS satellites moving in a slightly different time because of their inertial frame relative to the frame on the Earth. Uh, again, discoveries that would not have been conceivable that far back. Um, we, uh, we're we living in a time where we can no longer afford to guess how things work. We are critically dependent on science. It's moved uh, from a novelty to a necessity. Um, in a similar way, Darwin faced huge pushback for his ideas about how the natural world evolved. Um, and we don't see any sort of uh, major uh, shift in how the religious authorities specifically tended towards beliefs that challenge their beliefs. Um, Darwin and Galileo both are both were were uh, receiving direct consequences for challenging precious sacred ideas that were largely opinion based uh, at best. Um, again, we're also seeing some some of this in the the recent handling of COVID, where there's a lot of opinions that are. Uh, circulating about how diseases propagate and the modes of transmission. And what's really hard to explain to some a visitor from the past, for example, is how we not only have the expertise to understand so much more than we're able to act on, 
uh, we're not exactly sure why people are so unwilling to accept ideas that might actually save lives. Um, I'd like to read a few quotes from the late great Carl Sagan, who in some ways is a, a spiritual torchbearer of Galileo, who paved the way for all for so much of modern science to develop. Um, this first quote, one of the saddest lessons of history is this, if we've been bamboozled long enough, we tend to reject any evidence of the bamboozle. We're no longer interested in finding out the truth. The bamboozle has captured us. It's simply too painful to acknowledge even to ourselves that we've been taken. Once you give a charlatan power over you, you almost never get it back. And the second quote, this was written in 1995, and I still have a hard time believing how extremely timely and prescient this sentiment was. I have a foreboding of an America in my children's or grandchildren's time when the United States is a service and information economy, when nearly all the manufacturing industries have slipped away to other countries, when awesome technological powers are in the hands of a very few and no one representing the public interest can even grasp the issues. When the people have lost the ability to set their own agendas or knowledgeably question those in authority, when clutching our crystals and nervously consulting our horoscopes, our critical faculties in decline, unable to distinguish between what feels good and what's true, we slide almost without noticing back into superstition and darkness. The dumbing down of America is most evident in the slow decay of substantive content in the enormously influential media, the 30 second sound bites now down to 10 seconds or less. Remember 1995, lowest common denominator programming, credulous presentations and on pseudoscience and superstition, but especially a kind of celebration of ignorance. Mark Twain is often attributed with saying it's easier to fool people than to convince them that they have been fooled. We don't have the answers for how to do better, but we know that we can and it's worth aiming for, however that may be. So uh, let me just end with Stephen Hawking's quote about Galileo. Galileo, perhaps more than any single person, was one of the first to argue that man could hope to understand how the world works and moreover that he could do this by observing the real world. And this is uh, in line with the modern adage that the nice thing about science is that it works whether or not you believe in it. So that's Galileo's history and legacy and influence in a brief nutshell. I hope you found that interesting. And I'd like to open up for any questions if anyone has anything that they'd like to talk about. One of the first things finally mm -hmm. occurs to me is you mentioned Galileo's dilemma. Can you state just what that is briefly? Galileo's dilemma um, essentially was how far do you push on uh, the hand that feeds you? Uh, he, he was aware that his discoveries were providing some unwanted criticism of the church, and yet the influence of the church at the time uh, was largely what gave him his political appointment at the university in Florence. Um, so he had to kind of weigh the risks of popularizing his discoveries versus keeping them for himself and, and documenting them, but not getting so far out of favor with the church that he would no longer have a post from which to work and make those discoveries. Hey, Eric, um, this is a really great presentation. I think this is your best one yet, as far as I'm concerned. I really, really enjoyed it a lot. Um, Thank you. Did you say that Galileo's telescope was only a 14x magnification? Yeah, so he went through two That's different iterations. Uh, no, it's not actually. Um, 14 times, uh, he, so he didn't invent the telescope. That was actually a, a Dutchman named uh, Hans Lippershe. So he made a very crude telescope that Galileo got wind of and he, he built his own using the method that Lippershe had described. Um, the first telescope that he had was 14 times magnification. He built a second one that was a little more uh, refined, and that was roughly 20 times magnification. Um, one thing that stands out to me um, with the benefit of having used several different types of telescopes over the years is the proportions that he used. Now, um, the, the ratio of the aperture to the focal length, that's what we call the focal ratio, um, the slower that is, it's just like photography, if you're familiar with that at all, the faster a lens is, the more light you can gather. 
um, his his telescope had a ratio of uh, whatever essentially 1300 um, divided by 24 was. It's an extremely high number, which means that the amount of light and detail he'd be, see, be seen was very low. Um, typically, most telescopes are between f4, f8, maybe f12, um, much longer than that. And you're just looking at such a small little pinpoint of the sky that you can't really make out a lot of useful detail. So uh, he did get a lot of magnification out of that, but it may have come at the expense of some of the, the detail. Uh, despite that, he was able to make these clear observations, but yeah, his telescope was very primitive. And, and even the worst telescopes you buy today will drastically outperform anything he had. Uh, the little finder scope I pointed out on my telescope is leaps and bounds better than anything he could have dreamed of in his time. And yet that's just the, uh, you use it for five seconds to find an object and then, then put it aside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's incredible to put in context the the technology. Yeah, well, you gotta start somewhere, I guess. You know, in anything. Yeah. Like the first computer was uh, had about I don't know, like four hundred k or something of memory and filled up a whole building at MIT. Or yep. Something like that. Maybe it was uh, maybe it was four hundred bytes of memory. I don't know. It was, yeah, something like that. Kind of thing. Definitely. <laughs> I mean, in the early days of the Apollo program, well, or even before that, the computers they were using would take up rooms and often they would just have the bare minimum computational ability on board and then transmit the data down to mission control where they could afford the entire floor's worth of computing power to actually get more uh, resolution in from the data. But nowadays that is just trivial. You can have multiple layers of redundancy by having high powered computers both on board, multiple computers even on board, uh, like the space shuttle, I think had three uh, three layers of redundancy, and they would all check with each other and do group cross checking to make sure that they were all agreeing in real time. And yeah, and that's just fifty years worth of progress. It's kind of amazing. Yeah, like in the Apollo missions, I mean, they they had like you know HP eleven C calculator or something to figure out, like you know all these projections and everything there's some weird stuff and then when they got stranded in Apollo 13 you know they they just had you know hardly anything to compute you know the what they needed to to do luckily they got it in the ballpark uh, but that's just amazing yeah, yeah. and a lot of uh, slide rules and sweat <laughs> <laughs> yeah Anybody yeah. else have any questions? Yeah, Robert has. So go ahead. More of a com more of a comment than a question. So what caused my fall from grace? I was raised Catholic, and at age twelve, I took the proceeds from my paper route and bought a seventy millimeter Tasco telescope, and and went to the newsstand and bought Sky and Telescope, where they had the ephemeris of the moons of Jupiter, and you could, and converting universal time was always a challenge, but uh, yeah, but you, you could see when the moons were going to uh, have their keep, shadows. Keep going, I'll be right back. And go yeah. behind. Um, what he's talking about, I'll just share, because I had that exact same experience. Um, I've talked about how in the past uh, astronomy is what led me from a very fundamental religion. So this is Sky and Telescope. I've, I've been getting this for years too. Mm -hmm. So he's talking about the ephemeris tables. Um, they do it a little differently. Let's see if they have the, the little chart that you're talking about. Um, oh, looks like they don't do that the same way. But it used to be like there's the, um, the two page spread and then yep. they would have uh, the tables for all the planets and then it was given in coordinated universal time. So you had to always calculate what is it minus seven, then minus, minus seven plus one, depending on whether or not it was daylight savings. And But what yeah. you can do is uh, they would, looks like they don't publish it the same way, but they would put like um, a time map and then the planet yeah. or the moons would move around. And then you would just use a ruler or straight edge and find what time you're gonna be out. And then the yep. point where it intersected with the curves is where the, the moons would be. Yeah, I, I did the exact same thing as a kid, and those are really good memories. And it, yeah, and so I guess that two-page spread in Sky and Telescope 
and the other uh, fold out in Playboy are the things that uh, led me away. <laughs> we get the telescope. Yeah, you're, we'll you're just about, you're unlikely to get either of those in church. <laughs> about the same odds, I'd say. How, how, however, however, the beauty of this thing, and I later went on to grind a six inch F8 telescope, a mirror, and um, the, the beauty of this thing is that a 13 year old can tear, can duplicate Galileo and tear down the whole edifice of the religion that he was raised in. And I think that that is profoundly romantic and beautiful. And Absolutely. And that's what I have, yeah. I, I love that so much. I, I can relate to that personally and also just in the broader cultural sense, I think it's amazing that all these discoveries are repeatable and, and Galileo, um, I guess maybe I should have stressed more, but he was so fixated on uh, appeals to observation rather than dogma. And I think a lot of that was because of how much he, dist or he disdained being told he should think things just because when he could just go out in his office or over the ledge and prove that he had a valid point that didn't conform to the prevailing and, ideas. And, and, and around that time also, the anatomists who did dissection had to, to go and, and with, with observation rather than with the dogma of how many bones there were in the human body as stated in the Bible. So it was a great time of people actually doing observation. It was really cool. Yeah. And it's really incredible. I, I did my physics degree 10 years ago and physics has changed so much in the last 10 years that I, I'm, I'm learning things that I had only been hearing about in school as distant possibilities, maybe in my lifetime, maybe not. And that's 10 years. I mean, that's just nothing. And the, the crazy thing is that all the, the major landmark ex, uh, experiments that have been performed in the last hundred years, there's a sizable fraction that you can repeat in a very small lab with a small budget. Um, I remember the first time we measured the, the speed of light. I just, I could not believe that that was, that was the closest thing to magic I'd ever seen. I mean, when you go through all the theory and you, it's one thing to read it in a book and know that, you know, there's smart people off in multi-million dollar labs that are, are agreeing with each other and they're saying this thing, but it's another thing entirely to use a small meter in a lab and run a beam of light down the hall and then measure the phase difference and then do the math and then punch in the final calculation on your calculator and it comes back with a value that's within a percent of the speed of light. I mean, being able to repeat these observations and really realizing how difficult it is and how your intuition will fail you at almost every step along the way, that was very eye-opening for me to realize that the world is not simple. It, it really has no obligation to make sense to us, but the fact that we can persist and come up with observations and then test theories that are capable of predicting the future, future behaviors and describing the world around us accurately, it gives almost a, I, I hate to use the word faith, but it gives us a, a unique and powerful insight into the world because we can rely on these methods that are constantly testable that give us better ways of uh, understanding the world and then living in it. Jared, can you, you said something there about the magnification of the telescope is all through the eyepiece. I don't understand what that means exactly. Ah, okay. Um, let me go back to that picture actually. Um, I'll do a shameless plug for um, our Wednesday program. If you want to join, join us there, we'll talk a lot more about how right. that worked. Um, but this diagram will give you a hint. Um, so the, the focal length, that's what's labeled. Um, I'm actually not sure if it's F1 or F1 plus F2, but essentially the, the distance from the objective to the eyepiece, the, the length of the path of light from the objective to where it meets your eye, that is one major factor in determining the magnification. And so the longer that is, um, that's where we get the, the F ratio, the focal ratio. So the longer that is designed, um, that will basically give you 
what's a good way to say it? it's like a good that's where the baseline of the telescope is so there's a minimum magnification that it can have um so when you put in an eyepiece a really common eyepiece to start with is a 25 millimeter uh, eyepiece and the way you find the power is to divide the effective focal length so the length of the light path um, and divide it by the um, focal length of the eyepiece so in um, the case of Galileo's te telescope 1300 divided by 25 millimeters that would give you a certain um, magnification whatever that comes out to be I don't know but uh, if he had had a different telescope that was say a much slower focal ratio so if we cut that telescope in half and had a lens ground that converged at that point so it is you have to consider where the the first here if you can see my mouse um, the shape of this light path this cone where it converges that has to be designed for the uh, focal length that you're using um, so if it you could design that to converge at this point here halfway down um, and now if you use the same 25 millimeter eyepiece you would get half the power because you've cut that in half um, it's I don't think it's making a lot of sense. I think it's a little harder to describe without all the visuals. And I, I have those in the other presentation, but it's, um, I can't really change anything in this diagram. So I, I apologize for that. But um, you can, you, you basically have two factors. It's the, the overall fixed length of the telescope, which you can't change after you buy it. Uh, and then within that, you can use different eyepieces to either ramp up or ramp down the magnification that you get from it. So in, in early telescopes like Galileo's, his appeared to be um, fixed. So there was no ability to change that. And it looks like the eyepiece was built into that. Um, and so you wouldn't be able to modify anything like that. And also this was using a slightly different design. I don't think he actually had an eyepiece. I think it was just two um, convergent lenses in series with each other. But that's not quite the same as a modern optical design. There, there were a lot of... Uh, post-Galileo refinements made by um, Kepler and others where they, they pro proposed new optical techniques for converging an image, preserving more detail and clarity. Uh, one of the issues that comes up with a telescope is that, um, especially in cheaper designs, is that light is not a single color. So when you focus light of different wavelengths um, in a cheaper design, they just say like, let's treat all of visible light, all red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Let's just assume that it's green because that's in the middle. And then we'll focus on that. So that gives us the brightest image to our eyes because that's where our eyes are most responsive. But the reds and the blues don't focus, they don't quite converge at the same point because they're not quite the same wavelength. Um, so there's some very sophisticated ways of correcting for that. Um, to, it's called chromatic aberration. Um, and there, there's a lot of ways you can get uh, uh, the, the different colors of light to converge differently. So you filter out different wavelengths and then focus them separately and then recombine them at the very end. Um, in modern photography, this is where most of the cost of getting a nice lens, for example, goes to uh, because those, those color differences are what give away a very poor quality lens from a higher one. Um, but Galileo wouldn't have had any of that. He would have just been dealing with a lot of weird color shifts and probably had a lot of fringing around Jupiter because it's so bright. But yeah, there's a lot of really cool things you can do to correct an image and preserve detail throughout the whole process. Thank you. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, I guess, does anybody else have any questions? Oh, looks like Robert. Robert, Robert do you have a question? Well, I have a recommendation in the chat window. I have a reference to a YouTube called We Are All Connected by Symphony of Science. And it's Carl Sagan, Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, Bill Nye and Richard Feynman, Feynman, and it's just absolutely, it's a beautiful atheist hymn. Uh, we need some poetry and music as atheists. So I would really recommend uh, to anyone who is feeling poetic this evening. And that's all I have. Thank you. Wonderful.